talking about several characteristics of rational functions without actually looking at their graphs. So the first thing is we have four types of discontinuities to describe. Now technically a horizontal asymptote is not a discontinuity, but it kind of gets lumped in with the rest of these. But we're going to describe each of these and we're going to do them in this order. Every single time we're going to do them in this order just to, to keep it consistent and make it easier. Now, first of all, horizontal asymptote. Okay, a horizontal asymptote. We can abbreviate that HA. First thing that I want to tell you, and you want to remember this, is that technically a graph can cross a horizontal asymptote because horizontal asymptotes do not cross undefined values. So it make more sense when we talk about the holes and the vertical asymptotes. What a horizontal asymptote does is it describes the end behavior of these rational functions. Okay, so we talked about end behavior with the polynomials. We're going to talk about end behavior here with the rational functions. So as x is going towards negative and positive infinity, where are the y values headed? Well, for this example that I've sketched up here, I don't think that it's on your notes. You want to put it on there. This is an example of a rational function. This one has a horizontal asymptote of positive 2. The left side of our function is approaching positive 2 from below. The right side of the function is approaching positive 2 from above. Now, we have three scenarios of horizontal asymptotes. We have three scenarios. Now, it will be easier to remember these if you understand my explanation okay, of why they are the way that they are instead of just trying to memorize them. Okay? First scenario, if this top degree is less than the bottom degree, meaning you're looking at the variable with the largest exponent on the top and on the bottom, then your orthogonal asymptote is y equals 0. You must write it y equals Right zero means you have it's it's a line, it's a horizontal line, <coughs> so you need to write it as such. Okay? So for example, here's a very simple example. X squared over x to the fourth. Yes, I know that simplifies, but I'm focusing in on this came from a bigger function. X squared was the highest exponent at the top, x to the fourth was the highest exponent at the bottom. The reason why it approaches zero is think about as we're headed to positive infinity, we've got positive infinity squared of a positive infinity to the fourth. Which one's bigger, squared or to the fourth? To the fourth. What happens when you divide by a really big number? What's the result? A small number. That's why it's headed towards zero. It doesn't actually equal zero, but it's headed towards zero. The same thing applies when we go to negative infinity. Negative infinity squared, you square a negative number, you get a positive number, so that's how the infinity squared. Negative infinity to the fourth, still the even power. Um, you get infinity to the fourth, so it's still bigger on the bottom. That's why it's headed towards zero. When the degree on the bottom is bigger, your function on the ends is headed towards zero. So your horizontal asymptote is y equals zero. We'll, we'll get to the graph in a minute. <clears throat> okay? Next scenario. If the degrees are equal to each other, if they are equal to each other, then your horizontal asymptote is y equals the ratio of the leading coefficients. So what I mean by that is look at this example here. X cubed is the biggest exponent at the top, X cubed is the biggest exponent at the bottom. So they're the same. The coefficients of the X cubed in the top is 3, in the bottom is 1, so the horizontal asymptote here is Y equals 3. Think about it. If you're plugging in infinity, you've got infinity cubed over infinity cubed. Those are the same amounts, so they cancel out, so you're just left with the ratio of the that's why that horizontal asymptote is the way it is. The third scenario that we have is if the top is greater than the bottom. We don't 
don't have a horizontal asymptote. Here's why. I'm sorry about that. In this example, we have x to the fifth on top, x squared on the bottom. So you told me earlier that infinity to the fourth was bigger than infinity squared. Same thing applies here. Infinity to the fifth is bigger than just infinity squared. So what happens when you divide a really, really, really big number by a not so big number? The result is still a really big number. So we're not headed towards a specific value not leveling off towards a specific value, we're just continuing to grow, so there's no horizontal asymptote. Horizontal asymptote means you're approaching something on the ends. We're not approaching anything in this case. It's continuing to grow, um, so we do not have a horizontal asymptote. It is possibly a slant asymptote, which is another type that we'll talk about So, really quickly, let's look at example one. Determine the horizontal asymptote if there is one for each of these functions. So that first one right there, it's just by inspection, guys. This is not hard. You just have to look. In the top, we've got 2x. In the bottom, we have 3x squared. It's bigger in the bottom. So that horizontal asymptote is y equals 0. I put number 2 on there because sometimes they don't write it in standard form. Yes, I know that's mean, but guess what? It's what they do. So still look, it's not necessarily always the first term, but it's the one with the biggest exponent. So these are the same. So this is y is equal to 2 thirds. Sometimes they're fractions. They're not always nice, pretty whole numbers. Just write it as a fraction, okay? Number three, the top is bigger. Not because of the coefficient in front, but because of the exponent. So this one does not have a horizontal asymptote. Okay? Pretty straightforward, right? Okay. So, okay. The next discontinuity that we're going to look for is a hole. A hole is, first of all, created by factors that cancel. To figure out where the hole is, you set your canceled factor equal to zero and you solve for x. Guess what? When you're looking at the graph, the hole is not going to show up on the graph because your calculator doesn't graph it that in that much detail. But it does show up in the table. You'll have an error for the y value. We call holes removable discontinuities because it's just like you remove just a tiny piece of the graph. You can fill in that hole so it's called a removable discontinuity. Okay, so let's look at an example so you can see um, how we deal with holes. Okay, first of all, we're going to start building this. So we're going to start by identifying the horizontal asymptote. Does this function have a horizontal asymptote? No, it does not have a horizontal asymptote. So I'm going to say HA none. Don't write zero, write none. All right, so. I said that holes were created by canceled factors. So that means we need to factor this expression. Guess what? Not going away. Factoring is still here. Okay, the top is the difference of perfect squares. So I've got x plus 1 times x minus 1 over x minus 1. We cancel the x minus 1s. We are left with x plus 1. We'll come back to that part here in a second. So for the whole, we take what we canceled, we canceled x minus 1, and we set it equal to 0, and we solve for x. So that means our whole is located at x equals 1. Well, it's actually a point. We need to find out, well, what would the y value be if it weren't a whole? Okay? What would the y value be if there weren't a whole in the graph there? So what we do is we take that x value and we plug it into the simplified version of the expression. So we plug in 1 for x, so we get 1 plus 1 is 2. So our whole is at the point 1, 2. 
I plugged the x value into the simplified version of the function. The simplified version was x plus 1, so I plugged in 1 for x. 1 plus 1 is 2. Let me show you. We're not going to get really totally into the graphing yet, but I do want to show you here what happens with this function. Okay. Make sure that if you do plug these into your y equals, that you put the entire numerator in parentheses, x squared minus 1, over the entire denominator in parentheses, x minus 1. When I press graph, this is what it looks like. What, what type of function does that look like? A linear function. Well, I started with a rational function. Why does it look like a linear function? Well, guess what? That looks just like the simplified, my simplified version. problems, no issues, but look what happens when I go to my table. At 1, there's an error. Okay? At 1, there's an error. And notice that the y value should be 2. We're counting the high ones. The y value should be 2 right there. Okay, so that's where the hole would be. Now, when we do get to graphing, even though you can't see it on your calculator, when you graph it by hand, you're going to put a physical Now, let's look really quickly at back at the original part or the original function. If I plug in 1 into my original function, f of 1, I get 1 squared minus 1 over 1 minus 1. That gives me 0 over 0. Okay? That is what we call an indeterminate form. Indeterminate form. 0 divided by 0, technically we don't really know what that is. Okay, remember division is grouping things together. Well, how do we group nothing into no groups? Right, it doesn't really make sense. There's no definition for that. That is what a whole is. Okay, when you plug in that x value, you're going to get 0 over 0. And that's an indeterminate form. That's where a whole occurs. Okay? You can have more than one. Yes, you can have more than one hole. It is possible to have more than one hole. Then you would just set each of them equal to zero. Yeah. Okay, let's look at another example. Okay, we need to factor this expression. Well, first of all, horizontal asymptote, do we have one? No. Okay, this one does not have a horizontal asymptote either. The top has a higher degree than the bottom. So let's jump into our factoring. How do we factor that numerator? Grouping. Grouping. Yay. Grouping. Okay, take out an x squared from the first two terms. We're left with x minus 6. What do we take out of the second two terms? Negative. Very nice. So negative. Negative 1 leaves us with x minus 6. Okay, remember those are supposed to be the same. The denominator, what is it? x plus 3 times x minus 1. 3 times negative 1 is negative 3. 3 minus 1 is 2. We are not finished. We can factor again in the numerator because when we group our GCFs together there, x squared minus 1 is the difference of perfect squares x plus 1 times x minus 1 over x plus 3 times x minus 1. So what cancels? x minus 1. Our simplified version is x plus 1 times x minus 6 over x plus 3. So our whole we canceled x minus 1, the exact same factor we canceled in the last problem. So our whole occurs at x equals 1. But that's only half of it. I need to find its y value as well. Plug it into the simplified version. So 1 plus 1 